Hello and welcome to Ridge Church Online. My name is Krista and I'm your online host today and we are so thrilled that you found your way into this service. Now, if you're new, we wanna say a special welcome to you. Uh, we really care about connection and about community here at Ridge Church and about being known. And actually, we want you to know other people as well. And so, if you wouldn't mind, take out your phone and email hello at ridgechurch.ca and that's just that first step into getting connected here at Ridge Church. And also, uh, we have this amazing person. Her name is Dana and she's our Director of Connections and Community and she would love to let you know more about what it means to be a part of Ridge Church, what it means to know Jesus. And uh, yeah, I just encourage you. She's just so fantastic. You'll love to get to know her. We also have some programs here at Ridge Church called Ridge Essentials. And one of those programs is our starting point uh, class. And this is just that beginning step into getting to know who Jesus is, asking those tough life questions like, why are we here? What's my purpose? Who is God? Is he real? All of those deep questions that we wrestle with, um, that's the place for that. And so again, you can email Dana with that request. Um, these classes, they go on rotation and so there's always a new one happening. And we would love for you to be a part of that. We also care deeply about the embodied experience here at Ridge Church. And that just means being here present with us in the building. And so if you're unable and online is what you feel comfortable with, then we just bless you in that. But if you are able to come join us in the building, 10.30 on a Sunday morning, that's where we meet. That's where we gather together, where we worship together corporately, where we're able to build community with each other. And so we just encourage you to that end. We have safety precautions in place and we make sure that people keep masks on and things like that. And so again, it's a safe way to gather with other people. And we really hope that you do. On another note, uh, we just, for anybody that calls Ridge Church home, we actually give and we tithe, which is sort of a way to, to worship God. It's a way to honor him with our first fruits, with our finances. And it actually is the way that ministry goes forward here. So everything from this online service to our kids ministry, to our youth and young adults ministry, to our flourishing community groups and when people get baptized and things like that, that is how this happens, is by your generous partnership in that. And so this is that reminder to hop on the website. You can do that online at ridgechurch.ca slash giving, or you can actually set that up um, in the office here. You can come by on a weekday. Again, we are so thrilled that you're here. We're just going to settle our hearts as we lead into service. And so why don't you do that with me? And let's pray. Father, again, it, we just are so thankful that we can meet in this way. I often repeat this, and I am grateful that we have this online community that can feel safe in their homes. And God, that you really do meet us exactly where we're at. God, that is such a wonderful picture of grace and your kindness. And Father, we, we would just be very grateful for that in this moment. God, would you continue to speak through the message that's happening today? God, would you meet us in the worship that is going forward today? And Father, um, would you just continue to do a work in us to transform us into more of the likeness of your son? God, would you continue to remind us of the gospel and everything that Jesus did for us? And God, is again, as we're sort of thinking that we're about to enter into the Easter season, would that just be on the forefront of our minds? God, go before us today, be with us today in this service, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's worship together. And I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied.
Uh, well, welcome. Glad you're joining us today. And just want to say a special welcome if you're new here among us. My name is Jonathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridge Church. And we're just uh, glad that you found us online. And I want to invite you to continue to walk with us. Uh, I want to let you know that our Good Friday service is coming up this Friday. Uh, and it actually is not at 1030 when our service normally is. It's at 10 o'clock uh, this Friday. And so I want to encourage you to come. Unfortunately, we're not able to do Good, Sur- Good Friday service on online this year. We just don't have the bandwidth to be able to do it well. And so we're not going to have an online service this this Good Friday, but I'd encourage you come. There's lots of space. If you want to use a mask, you're more than welcome, Uh, but uh, it'll be just a great uh, morning. We're gathering with the city churches uh, to celebrate and to remember what it is that Jesus has done. It's going to be a powerful morning. It's going to be an incredible celebration of uh, Jesus' death and the price that he paid for us on the cross. So I want to encourage you to come. In fact, this is the topic that we are looking at uh, today. Uh, we are, uh, we, in this passage that we're coming to next in the Gospel of Mark, it is, if you look at it from just a very clinical, removed way, it is a description of the death of a man as he hangs on the cross. And frankly, in the Roman world, this was not a particularly unusual thing. Uh, over the course of Roman uh, history, they, they crucified tens of thousands of people. And so the account that we're coming to today, in their mind, was just another uh, Jewish you know, Messiah wannabe that needed to be executed. It was just another Friday uh, on that day. But the fact of the matter is that the, the three hours that we're going to look at today, th- these three hours were no ordinary hours in, in the history of the world. In fact, these three hours are the fulcrum of the history of the world. There is no more pivotal three hours in the history of the world than the three hours that we're going to look at this day. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 33. Here's what Mark tells us happens in this space. He says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachnathi, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So Mark tells us that from the sixth hour, in the Roman world that was noon, until the ninth hour, that's three o'clock. So from from noon to three, for three hours, he says, darkness covered the land. Now, lots of people have tried to come up with a natural explanation for what happened. Uh, Some have said, well, it was a solar eclipse. Uh, But, you know, a solar eclipse, you you know, is only a few minutes long. And and on top of that, uh, it never happens when there's a full moon. And and, uh, the Passover happened uh, always during a full moon. So it was not a solar eclipse that happened. Others have said, well, you know, probably it was a, a desert windstorm that kicked up so much dust that it blackened the sky for a number of hours. But the Passover always happens in spring, in the wet season, which means that that wasn't possible either. No, no, the the darkness that came on the land was a supernatural darkness. It it was a sign of the judgment of God. And we know this, we have this this picture from earlier in the history of of God's work in history when he brought judgment upon the Egyptians. If you remember when he brought the plagues upon the Egyptians, the last thing that he did before the Passover The last thing before he went through the land and and killed the firstborn was that he brought three days of utter darkness on the land of Egypt. So it's a sign of God's punishment, of his judgment. In fact, the the, uh, prophet Amos, uh, the Jewish prophet Amos, later speaks of the same sign of judgment. He's talking of the day of judgment, and this is what he says. He says, in that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. It's exactly what's happening here. 
And now, and now darkness comes on all the land because God is pouring out his judgment. And the question is, on whom is God pouring out his judgment? And the answer is that now God is pouring out his judgment on his own son. He's pouring it out on Jesus. You see, in those hours, although Jesus was utterly without sin, in those hours, all of the sin and the wickedness and the evil of the world was laid upon Jesus. In wave after wave, it was put upon him. All of the sins, of the, uh, all of the lies of civilizations were put on him. The, the, the murders of a thousand genocides and holocausts. The, the, the rape and pillage of every army that has ever marched on the earth. The, the hatred and jealousy and the pride and, and the anger of generations. And all the sin and rebellion of you and I, all of it was placed upon Jesus. And, and God poured out his judgment and his wrath and his punishment for all of that evil and all of that wickedness on Jesus, on his son. In the darkness, Jesus hung there and he bore it all. He bore it all in silence. And then at the end of it, at the height of it, after three hours of enduring that punishment, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he, he's not cursing God. He's, he's quoting actually Psalm 22. And what he's doing, he's grieving the fact that, that he and God the Father have been in this, in this perfectly intimate, ongoing relationship, not only through all of eternity past, but also through all of his time on earth. And now, because of the weight of the sin of the world upon him, because of the wrath of God that is poured upon him, God the Father turns his face away. And, and Jesus grieves the loss of that, that relationship in, the, in that moment. He is utterly abandoned. And the judgment that should have fallen on us, instead, it falls on Jesus. But it turns out this is all part of God's plan. Another prophet, the, the prophet Isaiah, 800 years before prophesied what would happen on this day. Here's what he says. Speaking of the Messiah, of Jesus, he says this. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Jesus was despised by the religious leaders. They were the cultural leaders of his day and by the political leaders of his day. And by many other people, they, they despised and rejected him. He knew that kind of sorrow. And the prophet goes on to say this. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. You know, on that day, what, what happened to Jesus was so brutal. It was so terrible that people would, would look away from him because of what had happened. And in fact, you know, this Good Friday service, as we remember what Jesus endured for us, there are these scenes that depict the suffering of Jesus that are incredibly intense. And in fact, we've We've made them grayscale. We've blurred them out in some ways because of how intense they are. But the fact of the matter is that what Jesus endured on that day was so brutal and so, so hard that it caused people to turn away and not look upon him. And then the prophet goes on to say, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. It was in that day considered incredibly shameful to be put to death by a cross. In fact, in the Jewish mind, if you were crucified, if you were hung on a tree, so to speak, it was a sign of God's curse on your life. It, you were cursed. In fact, the Jewish people understood this because of what the book of Deuteronomy taught, which was that very thing. And it cursed, it says, is anyone who hangs on a tree. So as Jesus hung there suffering and dying on a cross... It was that he became a curse. God cursed him. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says this, talking about this thing. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Then Isaiah goes on to say this. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. He said, this is what's going on. And then he explains why. Why all of this? Why, why did the Messiah have to suffer all of these things? Here's what he says. He says this, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. 
You know, sometimes in the part of Maple Ridge that I live in, and maybe in wherever you live, sometimes in the middle of winter, in the middle of this windstorm, the lights begin to flicker in our house. And when that happens, I mean, everyone in our house just, we hold our collective breath. We're like, oh no, oh no. And then, and then they flicker back on. And then typically after that, they just go out. And right away, we find ourselves plunged into this deep darkness. And, and, and even though we know the place, even though it's our home, we begin to sort of stumble around in the darkness and we start looking for, for a candle and where on earth we left the lighter. And, and I get my way into the garage and find the, the camp lantern and, and, and we pull it out and, and start it, except for, except for the batteries haven't been changed, so it only lasts about three minutes and then it, and then it dies and we look at the battery on our phone, which is also low. And, you know, in the end, we kind of figure it out. We, we kind of muddle our way through. But, but everything slows down, doesn't it? Everything becomes kind of limited. It, we kind of stumbling around. Everything's the same, but, but it, it's, it's all different. And this physical darkness brings into our world this kind of disorientation and, and this struggle. And the same is true when it comes to, to spiritual darkness in our life. And this is what Isaiah is talking about here. It's so easy to go astray and we can't see the light in our lives. The Bible tells us that God is meant to be the light in our lives. He is meant to be like the, the, the sun around which our world orbits. Just, just as the sun gives biological life to the world around us, the Bible tells us that, that God gives truth, all truth and all life to us. And if our life orbits around God, th then we find ourselves in the light. And, and, and it's good. But if you turn away from God, if, if, your orbit, if your life orbits around anything else, around your career, or around money, or, or around your family, or, or whatever else it is, it, if you look to that as the source of warmth and the hope in your life, it turns out that you find yourself in spiritual darkness. Now, those things, you know, money, family, career, in and of themselves, they're not bad things. In fact, they're really good things. The problem with them is that they're not the source of light for this life. And, and that means that if you pursue one of them really hard and you finally get what you thought would be this, this thing that would satisfy you, you know that it just, in the end, it doesn't actually satisfy because it's not the source of light in our life. And it leaves us with this sort of, sense of emptiness. That's this spiritual darkness that we experience in our lives. Now, those things aren't all bad in themselves. The problem with them is that they aren't the source of light. They, they, they aren't, there's no light that comes directly from them. That's why, that's why when people pursue them above God, when they finally get what they thought would be this thing that would satisfy them, it doesn't. There's this emptiness. It's just not big enough to fill that need in your soul. Now, again, these are good things. They're incredibly useful, incredibly good things when they're had in the light that comes from following God. But if not, then, then there's just this deep disorientation when you finally get what you thought would give you life. That, that's what spiritual darkness is. And if you seek your identity in, in one of these things, in your career or your marriage or the toys that you can afford or the holidays that you can go on. The problem with that is that that makes your identity very, very fragile and insecure because then your identity is always based on your performance, on, on keeping it all together, on keeping it going. And if something takes those things away, whether it's something that you do or something that is done to them or to you, I mean, it crushes your sense of who you are. It crushes your identity. And again, you get lost. You find yourself in this kind of spiritual darkness. You see, when we put these things ahead of God in our lives, then we become lost. That's what Isaiah talks about. Everyone goes their own way. And the, that willingness to put all these things ahead of God, that's what the Bible calls sin. In another place, it calls it iniquities. And it results in the spiritual darkness and ultimately in punishment from God. But this is what Jesus is paying for on the cross. This is what he's taking upon himself, our sins and our iniquities. That's again why the prophet says this. Again, he says this, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, 
In those three hours that Jesus hung on the cross in that darkness, in those three hours, God laid on Jesus the iniquity, the sin of us all. And then he poured out on Jesus the punishment. All of the punishment was due to you and I. He poured it out on him. This is what happened in those hours. Jesus bore the punishment for the sins of the world upon himself. It's the first thing. Here's the second thing that happened. Mark talks about it in verse 37. He says this. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When, when Jesus died, there was this huge curtain in the, in the temple. It was torn in two. Now, now this, this curtain, uh, it was about 30 feet high and it was about a foot and a half thick. So it, was a, it was a substantial curtain. It was like almost like a wall. And it separated a part of the temple that was called the, the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, from the rest of the temple. And that, that Holy of Holies, that place was considered the, the very throne room of God, the very presence of God himself. And no one was allowed to enter that space except for one man, the, 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 the holiest man in the entire nation, the high priest. And only through a very elaborate ritual could he enter in. And, and, and he had to wear this holy set of clothes. And when he went in, it was only on the holiest day of the year. They called the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, it's referred to now. And he had to bring a blood sacrifice to atone for the sins. And the curtain that was before that said, no one else can enter and on no other day except for this day. And now at the moment of Jesus' death, the curtain tears. But it tears from top to bottom. Very clearly, again, this is not a, a natural phenomenon. This, this is not, you know, your, your grandmother's curtains. This is something that only God himself could do. And it symbolized that in those three hours that Jesus hung on the cross, that the whole way that a human could approach God was changed. See, before that moment, the people of God had an agreement with God. It was called a covenant that uh, on how they could approach God. It was established through Moses, and, and it came to be referred to as the Law and the Prophets. And in essence, it was all about blessings and curses. If you kept the rules and the regulations that God set out, you would be blessed. But if you didn't, you would experience curses unless you went to a priest and made a sacrifice to atone to pay for your sins. Now, these days, will people say, well, yeah, that's religion. Of course, set of rules. If you don't keep them, if you keep them, you're blessed. If not, you're cursed unless you make some sort of atonement to, to the gods, to, to God. They say, well, that's why we moved past religion. We don't need that kind of religion anymore. But the fact of the matter is that this is the covenant that most people, whether they would consider themselves religious or not, still live under in relationship to whatever it is that they make the God or gods in their life. Now, let me give you an example. Let me, let me show you from the easiest example that's out there. You know, we can see this when it comes to the Hollywood gods. You know, if you want to be big in Hollywood, if you want to make it famous on the silver screen, there are certain sets of rules that you must keep. And if you keep them, you'll be blessed. You'll become famous. You'll become a big star. And once a year, there is sort of this most holy day when everyone is celebrated for keeping the rules that the Hollywood gods have set out. It, it's this very elaborate ceremony, this very elaborate ritual that, that requires all the people to gather around. And then those who are sort of the, the priests of this world, those who have kept the rules best, pull up in their fancy limousines and, and they wear these elaborate outfits and they, they walk down a red carpet. And then only... Those who have earned the right enter into the most holy place. And there, there's this another elaborate ritual where they hand out these golden statues. And it's called the Oscars. And of course, I, I'm not trying to make fun of it all. I'm trying to explain that in our culture, where people think that we progress past religion, it's not the case. There's all of this kind of religion out there. It's just different gods that are worshipped. But, but the rituals actually are not that much different than they were thousands of years ago. And the fact of the matter is that it's only Jesus who offers a more progressive way of knowing God. Because the, 
the covenant that, that you live under, under the, 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 the Hollywood gods, is the same kind of covenant. It's all about blessings if you keep the rules and curses if you don't. So, for example, if in the middle of the Oscars you get up out of your seat and go and slap somebody on the stage, which very clearly is unacceptable, it's wrong. Oh, the result is curses on your life. The result is everyone piles on you for what you did. The result is the people who used to want to be with you and around you all the time, now they, they, they distance themselves from you. And the people who are going to make a movie about you now cancel it. And the only hope that you have to get back in the favor of the Hollywood gods is to atone for your sins, to issue a public, very humble apology, to make a sacrifice, to resign from from the academy, and then to go and see probably the high priest, Oprah, and have an interview with her. And, and if you are contrite enough, if you atone enough for your sins, then you can become pure again. Then, then you can be good again. Now, that's that case. And obviously, you're not a Hollywood star. At least I, I don't think you're a Hollywood star. But you've probably seen that kind of, that kind of, Covenant relationship with the gods in the world around you the the same way, whether it's your career or your family or or a sports team. I mean, we've seen this kind of thing just on a smaller scale. However, that's no longer the covenant kind of relationship that we have with God. That, That doesn't mean that the covenant relationship that God had with the people of Israel was bad one. There's nothing wrong with it when he first established it. In fact, If you go and look at that covenant relationship carefully in the context in which God first established it with the people of Israel, it's brilliant. Uh, Compared to the the, the laws, uh, the civil and the religious laws of the people around it, the kind of covenant that God set up with the people of Israel was superior in every way. The the protections that it afforded to to the most vulnerable were nothing short of revolutionary. Uh, Protections for women, and children and servants and foreigners uh, all were way better under the Jewish civil and religious laws than in any of the surrounding nations around it. It was a perfect arrangement within a specific cultural context between God and the people of Israel. And of course, rightfully so, a sacrifice had to be made to atone if you broke one of those covenant rules. But at the Passover, at that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, the night before he was betrayed. Well, there Jesus offered a new covenant, a different kind of covenant. You see, the covenant that, that was before was between a nation, between God and a nation, and now is between God through Jesus and an individual. And the covenant that God had with the people of Israel, I mean, that was a bilateral conditional covenant based on the fact that both parties kept their part of the covenant, and if they didn't, it was over. But the new covenant, the one that that Jesus puts forward, is a different kind of covenant. It's a covenant where one party, Jesus, who initiates the covenant, promises to fulfill and keep it, even if the other party, us, even if we don't do that. And so that covenant that he offers is not bilateral and, and conditional. Rather, it's unilateral and it's unconditional. Jesus' intention was to do this all along. At one point, he was explaining what he was going to do. Here's what he said. He said this. He said, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now he's talking about that original covenant that God had with the people of Israel. He says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until, until everything is accomplished. So, what does Jesus mean when he said he came to fulfill the law? Well, the Greek term translated fulfill means to bring to its designated end. So, so Jesus didn't come to abolish the law in the sense that he wanted to say that it was bad and wrong and should have never been. No, no, no. He's not doing that at all. Rather, he comes to bring it to its designated end. So, that means like, for instance, if the law was homework, he would finish it. If the law was a speech, he would conclude his speech. If the law was a plane, he would would land it. What Jesus was saying was that God's conditional, temporary covenant with Israel was coming to an end. 
but it was always intended to end when everything was fulfilled, when, when everything was accomplished like Jesus said. And now in these three hours on the cross, everything is finally accomplished. Jesus has lived a perfect life, fulfilling all of the law and the prophets without sin. And now he has taken upon himself the, the, the sin and the wickedness of the world and has become the atoning sacrifice for all of that so that there would never be the need for another sacrifice again. So it's finished. Pastor and theologian John Piper writes this. He says this, Jesus was not just another member in a long line of wise men and prophets. He was the end of the line. He goes on to say this, to be sure, many instructions and rules and religious practices and rituals from the Old Testament are no longer to be practiced. But this is not because the practices and rules were wrong, but because they were temporary. We're pointing forward to the day when Jesus Christ would fulfill them and thus end them. The coming of Christ did not abolish them, but it did make them obsolete. Obsolete. You know what that means. Obsolete doesn't mean bad. It just means something new and better is here. Which means that my cassette tapes from the 1980s are not bad. Something better came. My CDs. But then they also became obsolete because there's a better way to listen to music. Those things aren't bad. There's just something better. And, the, and that's the point that he now makes about this covenant. The, the previous covenant that God had with Israel was not bad. There's just a better way. Now, how, how can John Piper say that the previous covenant that God had with the people of, of Israel was obsolete? Well, the answer is that he's referencing the words of the writer of Hebrews, who says this. In speaking of a new covenant, he, Jesus makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is all is ready to vanish away. See, here's the second thing that Jesus did on the cross in those three hours. He, he made the old covenant obsolete and he made an utterly new way to approach God. You see, the rest of the world, the rest of the world is still functioning under the old covenant. They're still working on the blessings and cursings and atonement to please whatever God or gods happen to be the ones that they're trying to find fulfillment in their life from. And frankly, if you call yourself a Christian and you don't understand what Jesus did on the cross, then you may still also be trying to live under this kind of a covenant. You still may be thinking that, that this obsolete covenant is how you're supposed to be right with God by, by striving harder to be better, hoping that you're blessed if you do and, and knowing, thinking that you'll be cursed if you don't and always trying to find some way to atone for what you did. If you did, you, you totally understand, misunderstand what it is that Jesus did on the cross. He not only paid the price for our sins, but he made it a whole new way to enter into the presence of God. That's why the court, curtain was torn from top to bottom. The writer of Hebrews Speaking of this very thing, at this very moment, here's what he says. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, in other words, the very presence of God, by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Not through blessings and curses. Not through striving to be good enough. You could never be good enough to be right with God. No, no, no. There's a new covenant based on grace and forgiveness and that brings such peace in our life, regardless of how much you mess up. That, that's the new way that God made for us to approach him through Jesus. If not, if you stick with the old covenant, then the gods of this world will always demand that you strive harder, and that you produce more and more atonement every time that you mess up. Do you understand? Do you understand how profound it is what Jesus accomplished on the cross in those three hours? It's the second thing. But there's one more profound, history-changing event that happened in these three hours. Mark tells us what happens now in verse 39. He says, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last, he said, truly, this man 
was the Son of God. You know, throughout the Gospel of Mark, nowhere, in no place until this point has any human made this statement, that Jesus is the Son of God. God the Father did when, he, when Jesus was baptized. The demons acknowledged it when they were cast out of people. But to this point, no human being, not the bystanders, not the people that Jesus healed, not even his own disciples ever declared that Jesus was and is the Son of God. And now, the first person ever to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God was not one of his disciples, was not one of the religious leaders of the day, it wasn't even one of the women who was standing there watching Jesus' death. No, no, the, the first person in all of history to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God was a Roman centurion, a Gentile, a hardened man, a warrior, a, a leader of man. In fact, the man who was in charge of Jesus' execution squad. Now he, standing at the foot of the cross, acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. He must have seen the way that Jesus carried his cross through the jeering crowds. He would have seen what happened when they nailed Jesus' hands and feet to the cross. He would have listened as Jesus prayed for these Roman soldiers that God would forgive them because they didn't understand what it was that they were doing. He would have watched as, as the religious leaders jeered at Jesus and how he, how he responded. He would have seen how the guys on the cross on either side, how that one heaped insults and the other Jesus led to find peace in the middle of their death. He would have watched as Jesus hung there in silence in those hours as, as the darkness covered the land. And he would have watched as Jesus took his very last breath. Now, I don't know if you've ever been present when someone took their last breath. But the centurion certainly would have been very familiar with this. He would have seen many die, many at his own hands. And of all of the deaths that he experienced, none was like this one. He must have seen the, the tenderness of Jesus in the midst of the horror that he experienced, and it pierced his heart. He, he, he must have seen just the beauty in Jesus' death as it flooded the darkness in his life. And there at the foot of the cross, he acknowledges for the first time ever a truth that would shape the lives of hundreds and millions of people throughout history. And that's this, that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the day, as the scholar N.T. says, that the revolution began. This was the moment that Jesus' death on the cross began to utterly change and transform people's lives. And shortly after this, the eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and to his death and soon to be his resurrection also would make that same proclamation. And the good news of what Jesus did and who he was began to spread like wildfire and soon hundreds and then thousands and then millions of people around the globe began to live in light of this fact. In fact, centuries later, centuries later, another soldier, Napoleon, would acknowledge that nothing that he had accomplished in his life came close to what happened as a result of what Jesus suffered on that day on the cross. Here's what Napoleon said. He said, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, he had an empire in the Middle Ages. He said, and I have founded empires. But on what we did rest the, but, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. What happened on that day during those hours utterly changed the course of human history. In fact, next weekend, millions, no, actually billions of people will pause in their lives to remember and to celebrate the death and the resurrection of the Son of God. To this day around the globe, Jesus, the Son of God, changes and transforms the lives of individuals and families and cities and entire nations. And we see it right here in our city, in Maple Ridge Pit Meadows, that God continues through the, what Jesus did on the cross to transform people's hearts and lives and their families. And it's a beautiful thing to see and to be part of, and he's done it in our own lives. This is what Jesus accomplished on the cross. You know that those three hours that Jesus was on the cross, they were, they were utterly brutal. 
But he did it because of his great love for us. In those hours, he endured the wrath and the punishment of God that was meant to be on us. And in those way, hours, he made a new way, a new covenant, so that we could approach God in a different way, filled with grace and love and forgiveness. And through it, he began to bring hope and light and salvation to millions of people around the world, even today. So, what does that mean for you and I? Well, for those of you who have not yet claimed Jesus to be the Son of God, if you want that, if you want to live under a new covenant, a covenant of grace and forgiveness, you know, you, you can have that. But, but the sacrifice that Jesus made is only yours if you appropriate it, if you accept it, if you allow it to be on your behalf, which means that you need to, you need to acknowledge him as the Son of God, which means you need to think differently about this life and what it's about, which means you need to, to make God the center of your world that you orbit around. But you can do that today. It's a matter of just saying, God, I want that. I acknowledge I've been a rebel. I deserve to be punished for my sins. I accept what Jesus did. I want to follow him. You can have that today. You should choose that today. And then, and then if you're a follower of Jesus, a follower of the Son of God, you should never forget what happened in these three hours. You should never let it become just a trite thing in your life. that You're just like, oh yeah, yeah, he died on the cross for my sins. You should remember the incredible price that he paid. You should remember what he did. You see, Christianity is the only religion, the only belief in the world that, that acknowledges that God suffered and died. And he suffered and died not only physically, but emotionally he suffered a great deal as well. And it's this incredible proof of his love for you. And his suffering means that when you suffer, though it may seem senseless, just like those walking by on that day thought that Jesus' suffering and death was senseless. His disciples certainly thought that in that moment. Whether you, if you feel that way, if you don't understand why it is that you're suffering, the suffering of Jesus tells you what the reason isn't. You're not suffering because God doesn't love you. You're not suffering because he has no plans for you. You're not suffering because he has abandoned you. Jesus was abandoned. Jesus paid the price for our sins so that God the Father would never abandon you. The cross proves his love for you, and it means that he understands what suffering is. He understands what it is that you're going through. It shows that God can be at work in your life, even when there seems to be no rhyme or reason for the suffering that you endure. You see, what Jesus did on the cross in those three hours, it's profound implications for your life, for my life, and for all of history. And that's why we celebrate and remember his death this Good Friday and, of course, his resurrection this coming Sunday. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Well, God, we come to you this day. And God, we thank you again. We worship you for sending Jesus, your own son, to come and to dwell among us, to live this perfect, sinless life, and then to suffer on the cross, and to pay the debt that we so deeply owe to you, and to make a new way, a different way, to be able to approach you, so that we can come ourselves into your very presence with confidence and boldness, filled with joy because of what you've done, so that we can find you to be the, the sun in our life, the, the thing that gives life, to the, the one who gives life to us. And so God, on this day again, we're humbled by what Jesus did. And we honor him. And we pledge our lives again to follow after him. And God, we thank you and we worship you. God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you have done, for what you will do. We bless you and we praise you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father's love for us, how that's beyond all measure, that He should give His
his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen Sons to go joining us again today. I want to invite you, if you can, come and join us this Good Friday right here at Ridge Church in person, 10 a.m. in the morning. We're going to gather with the, the Christians from across the city to celebrate and to remember what Jesus accomplished on the cross and what an amazing thing it is. So we'd love to see you there. If you can't make it, we'll see you again next Sunday here online and, uh, and uh, worship together then. Let me end with reading you the words of the Apostle Paul. It's in the book of Romans. He's been writing about the majesty, the greatness of God and, and his plans in, in history. And then he comes to this. He, he just erupts in worship. Here's what he says. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And then he quotes, he says this. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be replay, repaid from him and through him and to, who, to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. <laughs>